was the last person. <laughs> I didn't do it. Yes? No, I'm good. Yeah? Okay, let's get going. Good afternoon again. Um, I'm Arjen. I run a business. Um, not the first one, and it's not the only one I run. I do a number of things at the same time because I have many, many interests. Now, I've done a couple of business-related talks before at mini cons as well as other conferences. Who here has been at one of those? Yes. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so I've done business-related talks for a few years, and it started at MySQL when I was doing community relations because I was dealing a lot with other businesses, obviously. And I was just observing how they were operating and how they could actually work effectively rather than just waiting, wasting a heck of a lot of money on things that wouldn't work anyway. Uh, sometimes business ideas seem brilliant, but they're not actually going to go anywhere. And usually money is not the problem um, in terms of being able to get it done, but money is the problem in the sense that it actually hinders stuff. So after I left MySQL, where I worked for six, seven years, I started Open Query and created that. It does training, consulting, and, and remote services. Now, that's not really important now. What's important is how the business is built. And I'd been, I'd been learning a lot, obviously, looking at how, how the company MySQL worked and grew and didn't work in certain ways and, and so on. Um, failures of other companies of doing something are brilliant because they teach you stuff as well as giving you the opportunity of not repeating it as well. You can make your own brand new mistakes, which is always more exciting. Um, I don't want to make someone else's mistakes. That's not fun. I want to do new stuff, right? Um, so I've actually first started with training and, and, uh, training and consulting, which is the basic stuff. And I was trying to figure out, because we were doing more and more in the consulting, we we're doing more and more remote maintenance and I was trying to figure out how to turn it into a subscription model that would actually be able to compete as well as differentiate from other places. And then you think about all the different things it does. What I came up with was actually a consequence of the way that the company was built already, namely not very far. It is a very simple company. It doesn't, um, it doesn't have or want to have many resources. It doesn't have that many people. Um, but there's a few things we value, and that is our, our spare time and our sanity and all that kind of stuff. The objective of this business is not to fill my entire week chockers so that I don't have any spare time. In fact, I'd like it to use as little time as possible. Now, less than 40 hours is probably not going to happen, but the point is, even though I'm running the business, I shouldn't necessarily be more, spending more than, than, than that number of hours. Um, so the problem is you need to prevent emergencies because if there's a drama on the phone somewhere and you really need to pick that up, then it, you get into trouble. Um, so the services that we offer do not include emergency services. We do not have 24-7 support. Now, because of the way we, we provide our service, but that gets my school technical, we prevent emergency. The fact that, well, let's pick a light here. If one of those lights fails, definitely fails, right? but it doesn't actually shut down this building. The thing as a whole still works. You can build web infrastructure and database infrastructure in a similar way. You can make sure that lots of things can pop out of and go up in smoke, but it doesn't actually make the whole system fail. And that allows you to leisurely check it out the following morning, actually do a proper post-moting, see what went wrong, learn from it, and so on. So that's how we do it. Um, but it gives you a bit of a background about why I'm dealing with business in a certain way. So collecting all that information from different bits of experience, my own thoughts, as well as various books. I have a book, book list at the end as well. Um, so if you're curious which books, I've got some. Um, we came up with this. And this is actually based on a talk I did at the Brisbane Bar Camp. And um, we started a little, a little website, Sideline Business, like I said, I do many. And it's called Upstarter.biz. It's not actually real business right now. It's kind of like a group of, a group of people. Um, you can subscribe to it. You get access to some internal resources for $5 a month, and you subscribe using 
your credit card or your PayPal account. It, it runs through a, a PayPal subscription. So it's really easy, simple setup. We set it up in about, a, I don't know, a couple, of hours, a couple of hours in a day. So again, low budget. And those are the rules, essentially, that Open Query runs by, but a number of other businesses as well. Some businesses just magically use the same idea. Some use some or are at least similar. And you could probably pick them in groups. Um, I'm not sure there's actually any sanity to the, to the order that, I'm, um, that I have decided to use. It just kind of evolved this way. Funnily enough, they have not really changed over the last year. Um, we're pretty much in agreement that, it, well, so far, that these work. You could pick an 11th, of course. You could trim it down to nine, maybe. But, I mean, people like 10, 10 lists. Um, Open Query or another upstarter will not have bank credit. We just don't want it. I'm sure I could get it, but I don't want it. Um, but also, I like my clients to um, pay up nicely. And the way I usually do that is by making it really convenient for them to do so. I make sure that in some cases there's discounts for paying quicker, obviously. That those are the usual things. Um, but I have the subscription system, and I try to keep in mind that if I try to make someone pay for a whole year, it's going to damage their budget. So I'm going to have a much more problematic sales cycle. And then once I've sold it to someone on a mental basis, then I need to get the money out of their accounts people. So it's going to cost me or my company, lots of time twice, which is not really good. Um, so I try to keep the amount small, which means that the financial risk, if something goes wrong, is also small. I don't have a debt collection arrangement with, with the company. I don't need it because if I lose a 1000 or even a couple of thousand dollars, so what? The amount of effort putting into chasing that is not, it's not interesting. Yeah? So those are the economics that I'm trying to convey here. Um, and I work on the, on, the, on the basis of a zero budget. There are some things called zero budget online, and that is not necessarily what I'm talking about. What I'm essentially saying is that if you have an idea, don't presume that you're going to toss money at it. You don't have a pile of money and then some ideas, and you can spend some of that money on that. If you work on the basis that it should cost no money, and it turns out that you're going to have to spend $40 on it, or even $400, or $4,000, so be it. But if you work on the basis that it should be zero or as close to zero as possible, it changes your thinking and it works really, really well and it prevents you from, say, from, from actually um, wasting money. That's the point. Um, I mean, many larger companies, of course, have a budget and somehow that budget needs to get used up. And, of course, that becomes very wasteful. So work on the, on the, on the basis of a zero, a zero budget. That works really well there. Um, Open Query has some goals, like not fill up my entire week, but provide a decent income for me and my, um, and my contractors. By the way, Open Query is now about 10 part-time contractors. Um, so it pays my full salary and a number of other people, and it's just gently going along. And we're not aiming for fast growth. We're just aiming for, for a nice lifestyle along the way and, of course, helping our customers well and keeping them. Once you have a customer, try not to lose them. That, that works really well. Um, so we have a kind of business goals, but we don't have a written up document saying, okay, these are our, this is our three-year plan, this is our five-year mission to explore strange new worlds, and so on. It doesn't work, because next week stuff happens, so we need to adapt. So we have an overall direction, and then we're really flexible. Now, the reason we don't actually need to have a business plan is that we don't have any dealings with the bank in terms of them giving us money. If you need funding from either VC or a bank, you need to deliver this stack of paper that's a business plan. Everybody knows it's bollocks. It means nothing, but it's kind of your ticket to getting the money. So if you don't want any money, you don't need to do that paperwork. It's much easier. So you do need a, you need a sense of direction, but this makes us much... It, it, do, it doesn't make us waste time on, on developing the business plan. Um, and we can actually spend time on exploring things rather than actually... Um, implementing what we think the world might look like. Whatever product or service we develop, it never hits, it never gets popular with the market that we envisage when we think about it. Once you start publishing something, you talk with various people, you get customers that you didn't imagine were there before, and they kind of control what happens next. And that tends to happen for all products and services. People kind of in denial about that, but products never get used by the company 
by the clients that it was intended for. So if you have a business plan that's designed to explore, learn, and adapt rather than, oh, we're going to do this and we're going to plant it in that market and we're going to do some market research to actually make that all good, it's a humongous waste of time, usually. Um, you can do it if you're a big business. You might get away with it, but many of them are just wasting money. So explore. Um, we tend to not very fuss very much with intellectual, intellectual property. We love sharing information. Pretty much all the information about how I run Open Query and also some other, other details, happy to talk about it. It is not a business secret that I need to keep because otherwise someone else might copy what I do. There's other aspects of my business that are really, really valuable. I know some stuff about my school, for instance, and that is, that is valuable. And of course, people know me and that kind of stuff you can't nick off with. It's very simple. It's me. Um, and of course, the people I work with. Um, and for other, for other organizations, of course, no, no stuff like software patents. It's just a humongous waste of effort, um, money, sending things to lawyers. It's not worth it. And very importantly, we put profitability before growth. Now, there's some resources online that say you should put, what was it? I think it's Guy Kawasaki who writes very interesting stuff. He says put cash flow first. But if you work on the basis of not being a lender or borrower, your cash flow is not a problem. And if you work on the basis of a zero budget, that comes along with it. So um, we just make sure that whatever money we spend, we make first because we don't have credit. So it sorts itself out. We can't not have the cash flow sorted. Yeah, it's automatic from the other rules. Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah. Um, what often happens is when you develop a product, and this might be a product could be a service, by the way, it could be software, it could be hardware, it could be any, it could be could be a service, um, or even online online software as a service thing. That sounds like a bad luck. Top bump. Um, what often happens is you have a cost of making something, which could be your overhead, it could be a hardware cost or something, and then you stick on the margin, and that must be the sell the sale price which is fundamentally wrong because that doesn't actually mean that anybody is willing or able to pay that price in your whatever market you think it will sell to, which is, of course, not the market you will really sell it to. What might work is if you think about, yeah, <laughs> it sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's, I know it's a long sentence, but it really doesn't work. Turn it around. You're talking with customers. It's probably already existing customers that you're talking with, and there's something extra you would like to help them because you're getting some feedback. For instance, for us, it is, we're doing database administration. We're more and more involved in system administration. We're kind of growing into that, and some of our DBAs are actually originally system admins. So we have this skill. We already have the contacts with the customers, but the point is what you charge, it's not a case of what can I get away with because I don't have a sales force, force to feed in that sense. Um, so what I try to work out is what is a reasonable price for that particular product and what can the client afford within that? Because if I think it's a reasonable price and the client still can't afford it, it's no use. Yeah, so it's the lower of those two. And I just make sure that with the profit margin that the company needs, and like I said, it has very low overhead. Um, we don't have offices as such and, and that kind of stuff. Um, with the margin I need, I just see, okay, margin cost, cost of overhead, I need to pay my contractors. Does that work? If it doesn't work, I might need to actually provide a different offering. So far, most little tweaks that we have to our business, uh, the, the product range that we have, actually do work out. So that's, that's rather nice. But the main point is, if you, if you work backwards, it actually works out really well. Swatch, you might know the, the watchmaker, they did this years ago. They wanted you to be able to buy a watch, I think, two of them for the price of like $150 or whatever. That was the, their target at the time. They just mucked around with removing parts from the watches and using different materials and learning more about the technology, even though they were already switched and they know how to make a watch. They just changed things until they actually had their production costs below where it should be um, so that their margin was sufficient to the actually sell you the stuff. And that's how Swatch entered the market. They, they worked their way back. They already knew what the sale price should be, and they actually worked their way back to make sure that it didn't cost as much. So that means they possibly could have actually made it cheaper even. It's an arbitrary cap that they put on it. Right? It had nothing to do with the actual cost that it could have been. So maybe you could even make a, a cheaper swatch. Um, 
the last the last items are, are fairly well the, they're my personal ideas you don't necessarily have to follow them but they they have effect on what else you do the disruptive one I'll spend a little bit more time on um, how are we doing for time by the way okay that's good I put my phone with my clock in there um, so first thing I ask and I often do this just sitting with people in the cafe when people have ideas or product is the potential is a potential client or your market are they already trying to solve the problem that you're trying to address because if you have a fantastic new mousetrap that's great no one cares really no one cares there's these wonderful products that get developed and then they're launched and you can tell by the press release that the launch is terribly exciting for the company that launches that product but no one actually cares and the world is absolutely right to not care because it, that's not their job they're just trying to fix whatever problems they're having so if your product or service happens to solve a problem that someone else is already trying to solve you've scored major wins all you then need to do is make sure that they find you or you find them and you can have a chat on some common ground like isn't that annoying well look at this I've got this that might actually help you and let's talk further and of course it's never quite the same but it actually gets you much closer if you if you have a fantastic product for a problem that doesn't exist or people don't realize it's a problem then you first have to convince people that there's a problem then you have to convince people that there is actually a solution that they want to fix the problem that you are the one that actually delivers the solution that solves that particular problem for them um, it's an awful lot of effort and I don't like effort um, effort is overhead so the amount of time I need to talk with the client to convince them that what I'm doing is the right thing I think is a pure waste um, the discussion on what open query does towards a client is a very short one it can be summarized in a couple of sentences it does get tuned to whatever customer whatever the customer is doing they have different focus of course so the story is slightly different but the essence is the same I don't actually need to sell what we do and how we do it it either blends with them or it doesn't if it doesn't blend with them I send customers to the, what some might call the competition I'm happy to do that it actually gets me credit with that non customer they actually refer people to me which which works rather well um, then when you once you have a product differentiating works really well and um, obviously you need that disruptive differentiation is um, something developed by, by um, Clayton Christensen you know the innovators dilemma book and and follow-ups from there and there's two primarily uh, two primary ones it's low-end disruption and new market disruption if just databases again MySQL was a low-end disruptor it was just good enough to do some things as in store and retrieve data and do, do some extra stuff but it's not Oracle yeah Oracle can do lots of fancy things it can't just do that but it was good enough for many people the word good enough is really important in low-end disruption um, there's a number of other aspects of, of it but essentially for what people were trying to do in the web the other proprietary pro the proprietary product at the time this is in around 1995 2000 that period they had what they call overshot the market the needs were like that and the product had gone like that because they kept building fancy fancy new features because that's what they thought the market want some of their customers of course wanted that you know customer advisory boards and things like that create that but that doesn't actually mean that the market at large actually needs those things you don't need to keep adding new features in that's really not an essential thing for either a product or a piece of software um, not sticking more features in is actually a way harder task take things out that works really nicely um, anyway you need to create something that's good enough accidentally well the low-end disruption at MySQL was created it, it happened to have a certain, a certain set of features it was identified that it could be positioned in that market and that's how it was essentially branded at the time low-end disruptor the new market disruption it got magically for free because at the same time PHP became popular the web was getting built it was so easy to use on all platforms and so on all kinds of aspects came together together that weren't directly controlled or com were completely uncontrollable and it happened to become the most popular open source database in that period um, so the new market disruption is just a, a bonus that that MySQL got I'm not sure there are many disruptive technologies that actually got both 
and you can often design the first. Sometimes you can engineer the second, but engineering both, you just have to get bloody lucky. And at some point you send yourself a billion dollars, so that's what MySQL did, they got lucky. Um, when you look at the product or your service, have a look at this. And particularly what you can reduce and eliminate. Because providing something that does something really similar to what someone else does and make it better, it's really not that interesting. Because whose word are we taking? You, the salesperson, will be telling a potential customer that you are better. Of course you would. You're not going to tell them you're worse. So whether your product is better or not is actually irrelevant. It is whether you can actually sell it to them. Well, to sell something to someone, you don't actually need to have anything better. You just need to be a better salesperson. So you don't need a better product. It doesn't actually give you an advantage. However, not having something is a real advantage. It can actually save you time and money. And in case of open query, it allows us to not have the trouble of setting up a network so that we can actually reach people in the middle of the night. We don't have that. Yeah, we don't have the whole pager buzzer um, stuff. And it means I don't have to worry about paying people overtime. But it also means, well, they can work when they want, but it means that I can actually get different contractors or employees. I have a number of employees who want to work part-time. Furthermore, they don't want to work in the middle of the night. They don't want to be called during the weekend. So that's a pool of talent that I can tap into that other companies can't. I have access to those very good people, and they wouldn't want to work for another company. That's fantastic. So by removing the emergency support from my company, it actually enables me to get, in some ways, a better, a better pool of talent on the other end. It helped me in a funny in a funny way, so that's eliminating what that can do. And similarly, reducing service can actually um, yeah, have a similar result. Um, for those of you who maybe were at, at OSTC or, or heard about OSTC at, in, in Brisbane, we did a, we did a fun game at, um, at the dinner. Every table had Play-Doh, and um, about three Play-Doh tubs, uh, different colors, and the, the task was improve something by removing something and depicting whatever it was. And one of the examples that, that was so simple but depicted the, the essence of it very well, people built a, um, a slab with a calendar intricately with all the lines and the numbers and, 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 and so on, and the Mondays were missing. They just took away the Mondays. They, well, they improved their... Yeah, it's, it makes the point perfectly. Sometimes it's so obvious you couldn't come up with that. And there are lots of different tables that did, that did just the most fantastically different, different things. But the, the object of the exercise, or the objective of the exercise was just tuning your brain into thinking, what can I take away to actually improve things? Because usually, particularly software developers, and I'm one as well, what can you add to make it better? It's not important. What can you take away to make it better? Um, that's it, I think. That's my, oops, that's the book list. Um, questions? I know it's a bit quick. If, if you want um, to subscribe to the Upstarter stuff, feel free, upstarter.biz. Um, like I said, $5 a month. It doesn't actually pay for anything in particular. It just means that it's not free. Um, it triggers a reciprocity issue. Um, and if you have any questions, that's, that's fine too. I'm here all week, including the weekend for Drupal South. Anyway, questions? Anyone? Feel zonked out, tired? We're only going to have probably time for one question anyway. That's okay. Anybody else? If it comes. I'm competing with the pub. Fair enough. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> one question. Well, one is just about enough then. Run, run. You're competing with the pub. I've been uh, speaking with uh, quite a few of my friends who run their own like freelance and consulting businesses. Yes. And um, I've had a discussion many times of how you actually charge clients. I know you touched on it a bit. And uh, some people said to me, well, if you're, you're paying a, a guy to do work for you, you might charge double or you might charge three times. Do you have any anything to say about that? Okay, so the question 
please tell me if it's, if it's wrong. I'm trying to relay here. Um, the question is, yeah, do, do you, how do you work out your, your consulting fees and, and, and depending on when you, when you do the work, do you actually double, triple, that kind of stuff? There's a couple of points to that. First of all, what people are worth is not necessarily the same as what other people can afford. And that's really, really important. Again, your, your cost is not necessarily what other people can afford. The other thing is that increasing the price of something is not actually deterrent. So charging more after hours and charging more for emergencies, I've tried it, it doesn't work. I have a friend in Brisbane who kept upping, the, who, he wanted to retire and he had some customers who wouldn't leave, so he kept upping the price just to see what would happen. It was a dismal failure. At some point he had a client who for a couple of minutes work paid $3,000. How much money is that per hour? I rest my case. Admittedly, he's seriously good, but that's not the point. There's no threshold. If people are in enough drama, they'll pay whatever. And, and so if, let me put that this way. If you mean no, say no. So open query does not do emergencies, end of story. If you call me at 2 a.m., I'd get cranky. Yes, I get cranky at customers. I have been known to get cranky at customers because we have an arrangement. It's a mutual respect thing, and if they break that respect, I get cranky. Um, so, yeah, we don't do emergencies. So there's no amount of money that you can pay me to do that particular job. That's the line. If I had an emergency thing, yes, I would charge a little bit more just to make the point that it's a special case, but I really don't want to do that in this particular case. Um, for regular consulting, charge something that's sensible. Open query is bloody cheap. We charge 100, our base rate, and you get a discount when you, when you subscribe. The base rate is 125 an hour. We're thinking about charging a bit more for some ad hoc work because it's a nuisance to schedule, but again, it's not going to work as a deterrent. So it just makes us more money. Um, <laughs> so. The, you, have to, you have to decide what you actually want to achieve with your pricing. Do you just want to make a living? Or do you actually want to send a message to the potential client on how you want them to behave? Because usually the price differentiation between different products is, I want them to buy this instead of that. I want to discourage that. Well, if you want to discourage something and you're really serious about it, you might want to remove it. That works best. No, seriously, that works best. If it's not there, they're not going to... And, and in this case... Open Career has kind of embraced the no emergency thing, so it's now it's a whole it's a whole thing that you can look up, you can see it on the front page. It's what we do, it's now our image. And that makes sure that we don't have to explain why we don't deliver it, because it makes sense in the context. But of course, for other people's businesses, something else will be um, will be what's important. And for consultants, consultant companies always have lots of problems in terms of setting up a business model. If if you can also set up other things or subscription type things rather than short contracts, you're in much better shape. Cheers, thank you very Thanks. much. <laughs> I'm not, I don't work overtime either. So. <laughs> well, fair enough. And you want to go to the pub too. <laughs> Absolutely. So I have one little job, one small job to do before the, uh, before the mini-conf closes. Um, the mini-confs at LCA basically set it apart in, in a lot of ways from the, from the actual uh, from other conferences and the stuff that gets done at these mini conferences is absolutely brilliant and the people that organize the, uh, the mini comps do an absolutely brilliant job and they actually make these conferences worth going to so what the uh, organization has done is we have a small gift for Martin <laughs> and And in good open source fashion, he's going to share this around, I'm sure. <laughs> well done. Excellent conference. <laughs> it's, and yeah, it's a bottle of Sav Blanc, which we happen to do really, really well around here.